Hi, this is Eli Oakletree of the Snow King Beekeepers Association. It is May 10th, and we are meeting to discuss the queen rearing, especially with emphasis on grafting workshop that we're going to start this Saturday. Setting it up, sign up, figuring out how to do this. And this is the first time we formalized this. Last year we did it informally. I've done it before. But if we go through the whole process as a club and work it out, the bugs out this year, maybe we'll do it really formally next year. Right now, I want to know who wants to try this. I, as I said, I've been through the process a number of times, so I've worked out a timeline. And we will do like weekly emails to people who want to get involved. And we will just go through and I'll go through what I have and then see how many people want to commit. We've been talking like a seven week timeline to really raise robust queens, even with grafting, which looks like it's a 24 hour thing on the internet, but anybody who's tried it knows it doesn't exactly work that way. It's like those extreme makeovers where they want you to redo your bathroom in one weekend, okay? It, 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 that's not really the way it works. So this is the way it really works. So I'll tell you what we're gonna cover and what we can't cover. And then we'll go through why would you want to do this? Why would you raise your own queens? The timeline it takes for grafting, the timeline I've worked out for the club based on who can show up on Saturdays, although I'm open to running one in the middle of the week as well. It's just that most people can't. We'll go through only the amount of phys queen physiology and behavior that we have to go through because that in itself would be an entire session or two if you've been to queen behavior and queen physiology talks. We're gonna look for how to produce mated all the way through proven. We've seen them lay worker brood in a compact pattern. And that's why it's gonna take all the way up to seven weeks to finish the whole program. And I'm not sure everyone can commit to that. So I'm gonna ask you at the sign up to sign up for what you can do, which Saturdays, which part you can do. Grafting, grafting is the emphasis because everyone is fascinated with grafting as a queen raising method. It is actually not my favorite queen raising method, but it is the one that attracts the most attention. And I think there's reasons that we should go through it as a club, partly because it's a lot to go through on your own the first time. And then I'll talk about some of the non-grafting techniques, some of which I like a lot better. And historically, how did we ever get to this point? So for signing up, I will be happy to send this out. If you email me, I'll start sending you the weekly, uh, the weekly emails that we're going to need so that we can work as a group. I, I do need your $25 for the year annual dues if you want to do that. If you took a class, even in last October, you already paid it to Snow King if you, if you took a class with us. So, Email me after you listen to this, which Saturday sessions you think you could commit to. We're gonna start with one to 3 p.m. because it kind of works generically, unless we run two sessions, in which case we could run one earlier or one later. But we're gonna start with Saturday, one to 3 p.m. at the Malt B location, which is my house. The address is Snohomish, closest to the Echo Falls Golf Course off Highway 522, if you know where that is, it's really Maltby area. And then the Saturdays that we're looking for people to come, this Saturday, May 13th, then the 20th, the 27th, the 3rd, I can't be here the 10th. If someone else wants to take over, great. There's nothing that critically has to be done right on the 10th. Then the 17th, the 24th, and actually the all the queens should be proven or disqualified by July that weekend. So you could pick up a little before that, a little after that. Um, and there's gonna be extra queen cells and such too. But if you wanna get all the way through this entire procedure, you're looking at close to July 1st. If you can do Tuesday, Wednesday sessions, there's a certain number of things that actually would help us if we did them during the week, some steps. And some people, that's all they can do. And that's great. If you're a Tuesday, Wednesday person, there's the basic keeping everybody fed, 
There's like checking for supersedure cells and smashing them. There's some things like that. Each time you come in, would you sign the clipboard so we can keep track of your hours, especially if you're coming in and you're helping other people and you're actually presenting it. I almost expect some journeyman or journeyman candidates to sort of start taking it over and maybe take over June 10th for me. I know that we will end up with 21 mating nukes. We're going to go for four frame mating nukes because that's the most guaranteed, least maintenance, least stress way to be doing queens with the resources we have. After we get them grafted, having them emerge in a four frame nuke. And then out of that, I can't give up all that, all those resources, partly because we'll probably do a second session. So what we'll do is give people a proven queen on a frame of her own brood. July 1st is already getting kind of late in the season, not super late, but if you had quick queen acceptance, that's really gonna work well. And I'm sure there's gonna be these extra queen cells, especially if we do extra grafting days. If all you want to do is, is just come once, use the grafting tools, see how it's done, see if you think you can do it. Maybe mark your, your cells with your initials or something so that you know which ones you grafted and come back and check the next week and see, did they take? That's fine. We'll be doing that, but first we're going to start with the people who are going to try to go through the whole system. And the only way for us to coordinate this, I think, is weekly emails with updates and then the resources. Sometimes there's this really good grafting tools video. Okay, let's send you that, right? The, the week we're going to do that. And if enough people are interested, I haven't had a chance to ask Ron, who's on here, if he thinks he wants to start a Sunday session at Granite Falls, do just a little bit of grafting. I know Ron wants to because he's been posting a lot of stuff on the uh, on the Facebook discussion group page. So I'm sure we'll be doing something else. Completely starting another session, we could start that like June 3rd if there was enough interest. And people, some people are totally tied up now. May is out of the question. They can't commit to it. What we can't cover, actually selecting breeding stock. When you go to select what queens that you're going to graft off of, that's a whole topic. That's a whole talk in itself. There are so many traits. I'm just going to suggest we do it based on the easiest ones with the queens that I have in the apiary right now. We have, we'll have five or six to actually select from. Queen physiology, we're not going to have time for a lot of that. That's a whole set of talks in itself. The real genetics of this, no, we don't have time. Actually controlling the mating, again, we don't, we don't really have a way to do that. We don't have the facilities for drone saturation, artificial insemination. So, okay, that's, we're not going to try to cover that. And a detailed sex life of the apis, in case you were hoping for all the details, no. We're not going to do that. And we can't really discuss commercial production. Our emphasis is the small scale beekeeper who would just like to try this or thinks they might do it enough to maybe sell a few, have surplus queens, overwinter those ones we need in the early spring. So we will cover, why raise your own, the best condition you can come up with. And that's part of prep work that actually we already did the last two weeks. We've already started prepping, locating the best high for donating pollen frames, for example. And we're looking at the brood patterns. And then we're gonna cover the timeline from selecting the stock that will be, we'll be setting up the, uh, the cell builders and selecting stock this Saturday, then do the grafting next Saturday. So we're gonna go from, before you graft, one week before, the project will run May 13th through July 1st. Then there's the problem of what do you do with your new queens? So quickly we'll talk about overwintering surplus queens. If you are, if you've been watching Michael Palmer and his double nuclei method, uh, basically getting two queens separated by a divider or nukes put side by side, kind of wrapped together for the winter, 
I basically did that and it was pretty successful. Even with this awful cold, damp spring, it was pretty successful. I am rather pleased with it. I think you can overwinter in much smaller colonies than I normally would have. Requeening, that's something that you, the first year you probably wouldn't even think about. The second year, no. And after a while you start saying, you know, I'd really like to take a strong queen through the winter that I knew would just bust out in the spring and start going. That late summer emerged queen is going to be more robust than most older queens. Not always, but the first spring, but she's actually emerged after the solstice, which our queens will be pretty much after the solstice. Then you might want to sell some. And you might be thinking about always having a queen or two in reserve. So starting with why would you do this? Well, there's cost. Although after you've actually grafted queens and done this, you might think $45 is a deal for a queen. <laughs> but they're available. If you have your own queens, they're right there. If, and if you could overwinter them, they're there early in the spring when it's difficult to get queens just by themselves and late in the fall if you had a late queen event and you lost a queen that re that late summer requeening to come out busting out in the spring there's quality control if you're tired of getting queens that seem to just poop out even when you get good quality nukes and packages by now if you talk to your friends if you haven't personally experienced it there's about a 25% supersedure rate. The queen just doesn't get fully accepted. She lays eggs, maybe. You Maybe you get supersedure cells, but she's missing an action before you know it. The bees don't seem to be accepting her. If you could avoid shipping and damage, because they know that queens are damaged in shipping, that's research proven. And if you could avoid the whole banking a queen in a cage, okay, that would be a big help. Locally adapted survivor stock. How else are you going to know that you got queens that were locally bred? If you can get those, you may be increasing your queen's longevity, her acceptance into whatever hive you put her in, her overall quality. And if you proof the queens yourself, you can relax, for example, overwintering them, that they are good, strong, worker brood, compact pattern layers. And when you're small scale, you don't need a huge number of queens, but a few here and there when you need them. And you need them used to a cool maritime climate in a way that we can raise them in this cool maritime climate that we politely call Western Washington, instead of just saying it's cold and damp. There is this high supersedure rate. It's, I said 25% for nukes and packages. A lot of queens are not making through their first year. Dave Tarpey, Allison McAuliffe, there's a bunch of researchers who've been working on it. And part of it, they believe, is shipping damage. Could be a lot of other factors, too. You've got to have a replacement plan in, in place. And that can be simply, where do you go buy one? Stay in touch with your, uh, your clubs, your friends. Uh, we have that list, that nine-page list on our website of nuke and package suppliers, a lot of them supply queens later. That late summer requeening is really popular, ro ensuring robust queens in the spring, you're reducing swarming because they're still first, winter, first spring queens, even though they went through a winter, if they emerge late enough. If you can um, decrease the loss of your entire hive due to the loss of a queen, a late queen event, sometimes there's no way you can replace that queen. Sometimes you can't even really open up the hive and try. But if you had an extra queen, you could at least try. When after merging is impossible and you just know you've lost that queen, you can just tell by the way the hive is acting. But it's already too, close, too late. It increases young queens, robust queens, they increase productivity. If you're not wasting time on queens that are poor performers. But you can only do that if you know you've got a queen or you're willing to pay for one to replace that poor performer. There's a lot of disease prevention in getting brood breaks and picking genetics, picking the queen that did better. 
uh, last, last, maybe during the, the summer, you saw her do better and trying out different strains. Some people want to requeen for that reason. And fortunately, some people requeen for reasons I, I can't promote. A lot of times people say that the queen is the main cause of a spotty brood pattern or a brood diseases, especially early in the spring, or she's the main reason that there's a higher percentage of drone brood comb in the hive. Correctly placed, but there's way too much drone brood. And sometimes people feel that the color of the queen guarantees certain traits, like okay, like black Angus beef. Okay, but but black in a in a, in cattle with this conformation with these genetics gives you a certain type of beef. At least people pay extra for it, so it must be true. But blaming the queen for all that is not necessarily true. So I'm not promoting requeening as the answer to everything, but especially that in the spring, knowing you've got a strong queen that's not likely to swarm. The other thing about raising queens is you kind of become part of beekeeping history and traditions. And in the journeyman manual, if you've taken the journeyman course for WASBA, they want you to go through knowing some of this folklore and tradition and names like important in queen rearing, not just Langstroth, but Zierzon, Quimby, do little, and there's some others, and methods. Unfortunately, a lot of those methods, you're reading the older books, right? The older books are really affordable. And you read it, and you're seeing this really neat looking queen method, but it's based on a wax foundation that you can easily cut a queen cell out of. And we're working almost exclusively, I think beginners and small scale are working in plastic. And that cutout is just not possible. You try to scrape that queen cell off, you're going to destroy it. And uh, cheap labor, unlimited time and labor out on farms. And sometimes they're using swarm cells, waiting for those, those swarm cells and increasing that way. Waiting for the queens to requeen themselves by supersedure. And that may not be something you want to do now. Miller method's an, an example. In the Miller method, you encourage the bees to raise out queen cells where you could get them by cutting V shapes into wax foundation like this on the upper left. And then they draw a comb. And if you're lucky, they draw it out in a way that's that they're well separated or you pick which ones you're going to take. And you can, because it's wax foundation, cut out around the queen cell and then sort of use that extra wax that you cut well around to push a queen cell into another drawn comb frame. But it's based on wax foundation. Grafting, on the other hand, can be done on anything. And this is basically what grafting is. You are picking out eggs off a, off a brood frame here in the upper left, and you're putting them into teeny little cups, which are fake queen cups. You are fooling your bees into thinking that they should make a queen in that little cup. And then when it's drawn out, quite often it's, you could take the bottom of that cup and shove it into, oops, sorry there. You can shove it into a, a wax. There's ways to take each of those cups and put them on separate frames. Now, if you get swarm cells on plastic foundation, huh, you can move the whole frame, but then you have to pretty much smash all but say two of the swarm cells, because there can be only one, right? So if you're using swarm cells on plastic foundation, you end up throwing away a lot of them. People are fascinated by grafting. It's not my favorite method. I don't think it's the best small scale method, but it is the best known. It's understandable. You get to see the steps. It's very visual, very hands-on. We have a short season. If you want a lot of queens fast in our shorter season, and, and our season is sometimes not that short. We have wonderful February, March, April, those of us who dream of years gone by. Yes, we used to have those. Okay, we didn't have it this season and we didn't have it last spring. And we don't know about next year. So crafting starts to look a little more <laughs> attractive. If you want to scale up your operation, 
that it, hey, this is what you want. Is something like this grafting, these queen cups filled out on that, those queen cells on that grafting frame. You can get the individual queen cells instead of you had to take the whole plastic frame, smash all the other swarm cells, and then you could move the whole frame. This is a lot easier, uh, takes up a lot less room. Why would you not want to graft? It's actually not the way to get the earliest queens. Some people go ahead and graft earlier than they should miss. They really shouldn't graft that early. They're going to have a high failure rate. On the other hand, some people say it's worth the risk. If the weather looks good early, I'll graft early. Otherwise, grafting would not have been possible until where I am until a few weeks ago. Could have started a little earlier, I think. But then again, the weather, can, anything can happen with the weather. So you wouldn't get the earliest queens with grafting. You can start earlier with some other methods that I will mention. And it's not the most reliable in Western Washington weather because you're trying to figure when is the queen going to emerge and make her mating flights. You do need some special equipment. Whereas with just walk away splits and use in swarm cells for splits, you don't need special equipment. To get quality queens, if you had time to work with the breeding stock, do some record keeping, do some testing, do some evaluating your queens. If you had time to study queen bee basics, that would be great. We're just really gonna go on and talk about the last part of quality queen production, which is getting the right resources and enough of them. You need nurse bees. You need mating nukes to prove these queens in. Something that you can put the queen cell into that she flies out and mates and doesn't run into other queens when she comes back in. Because there can be only one, as we all know. And if you have labor and time, what do you have for those? Nutrition, highly important. There are a number of YouTube videos out by famous names that talk about how important it is to have good nutrition to get good queens. You need a flow going, pollen and nectar, either real or you're going to have to boost it, or you might do both if you don't trust our weather. The weather timing, that is really important, especially for the mating part. You could start, um, Randy Oliver even did a video where he was starting his grafting procedure in the snow. He had snow on the ground, but he was counting on the fact that the weather was going to make this sudden change. I think he was right that year. But I, I'm sure that he assumes sometimes he's going to take a loss on that. But he's got all the equipment out. He's just going to start again if the first set is a loss. He can't get those queens to mate. You do need the drones. And you are counting on nature's calendar, phenology, for all of that last part. Can you raise queens without grafting? Yes. The so swarm cells we're pretty familiar with. Usually in your first year or two of beekeeping, you try that. And just the walk away split. You just split it in half and let the queen, let the workers in the half that ends up with no queen raise their own from emergency or supersedure cells. There's other ways that are not so uncontrolled. They're somewhat managed. The wire wax found, frame found methods are the ones you read about the most. You can draw a compromise between grafting and the cassettes, which did I put a picture? I did put a picture of the cassettes. What you do is you get the queen to lay in these cassettes. Not everyone has great success with it. I have one. I have, um, uh, I think the picture of it coming up later. Yeah, this one. I have the QC100 was donated to us by a longtime beekeeper, uh, Wanda. And she she was getting at cutting back on her beekeeping and she donated a lot of queen raising equipment. So this one, you get the queen to lay in the little cups and the little cups are here. You get her to do that, then all you got to do is transfer the cup. You don't have to scoop the egg out. Trick is to get her to do it. So for grafting and to get quality queens. I can't do much about the stock, but we can do get the eggs the correct age. Just hatched larvae. You need a high percentage of nurse, bee, nurse bees, young nurse bees, not older nurse bees, but young ones 
they're just dying. Their hyperpharyngeal glands are just exuding the proper secretions that they can mix with their other glands, mandibular or salivary, that they're going to mix and they're going to make that royal jelly and give you the greatest queens ever seen. You need a high percentage of those. You are going to flood your hive with it and make sure that they are a high percentage of the population. You need to either have a natural flow or you're going to supply it. Nobody's going to want, their bellies are all going to be full. Drones. You do need drones, but that's not really a problem, especially this late. The drones are ready. Good heavens, there were drones in the highs probably months ago before the weather allowed any chance of mating. But if you ran it close, if you tried to do this earlier, you'd need drones either flying or purple-eyed. The larvae's eyes have turned purple. And if you're a person who likes to take your decapping fork and check for mites by <laughs> spearing your poor little drone larvae and ripping them out and checking, looking for the mites, you will see a point at which the larvae are starting to do the final stages of maturity and the eyes will turn purple. And that's called the purple eyed stage. I've never run it that close when I've been trying to make queens. The hardest part to do it early is you need to know that you're going to get mating weather about 18 days after you graft. Queen is going to emerge about 13, well, about 12 days after you graft. And then another six days is about when she'd start to do mating flights, if all goes well. And then they, it depends on who you read, but she is going to be optimally mated six to 10, some say 20 days after she's emerged. So you need to know that you're going to have that. This late in the season, I think we're finally there. There's going to be some mating weather, finally. It, it was really close earlier than this. But I, I think you could have grafted back a few weeks before. It was just, I didn't have the resources. Our highs were just not building up. I like to complain about I sit on a 476-foot high gra uh, ridge and there's constant wind. Sometimes it's not very tough wind, but it's always that land sea breeze that comes up every morning, kind of dies down in the middle of the day, picks back up in late afternoon, really common in Western Washington. But whenever I complain about my 476 foot elevation, somebody says, well, at 1200 feet. Okay. And then I shut up. But you also need, after you've got all this other stuff done, you need to have a place to put each of these queens separately. I have some mini mating nukes and such like that, but I'm not gonna recommend we try them to start. If we have extra queens, maybe. Maybe we'll go ahead and just do some of the mini, the kind they talk about, you just dump a cup full of bees in with the queen cell and you give them syrup and you just see if it works. If that queen can emerge, go out and make a mating flight and come back and lay. If we have extra queens, I have the equipment. We don't have time to really pick through the stock, but I would think that what most people would do would be what I would do. They'd say, okay, this one has, out of these major ones, the ones in red, the pattern that's really good. I mean, 95% compact, that new queen or the overwinter queen, she's just laying. You give her a, a blank brood frame, she lays it out, and it's almost completely laid out. Just those ventilation, heating holes that bees tend to leave in, even a compact brood pattern. She was, she, if she's overwintered, you've already, you have a trait there where she did overwinter. There's a couple of things you, over -limit, you eliminate by a queen overwintered in this climate. Not a lot, but there's some that if you did, if she overwintered at all, she is, she knows enough not to come out not to brood up too fast. Her offspring, no, not to. So her genetics are such that they're not going to brood up in January. I have this story I love to tell about who apparently was, all of her offspring were apparently photosensitive and they didn't have the brains to know that I don't care how sunny it is in January, you don't brood up. A lot like that. Then um, temperament. I don't, I don't think anybody would pick a, a grouchy, hive to an irritable hive to uh, to graft from when talking grafting i have to warn you one of the things that's confusing is it's like when we start beginner 
and you learn that a hive box, a brood chamber, a super um, brood chamber, a box is a box is a box, but beekeepers will say it half a dozen ways. And sometimes they're just talking about the box. They're not really talking about any special box. It's a box. But sometimes chamber box, they will have different ways they, they talk about it. In hive manipulation, we are going to take advantage of the bees. We're managing them. We're manipulating them. Okay. But we're making it worth their while to be manipulated. We are going to go from a queenless, we're starter hive, where we start the, the queen cells. We need the nurse bees to feel there's no queen for at least a little while. Then the hive can be queen right, and there's actually advantages to that, or it can stay queenless. Once the queen cells are being developed, they actually start giving off some of the queen pheromone, and the hive says, oh, we have queens in development, and that's good enough. That's sort of queen right. But sometimes we are talking about that as if we're putting them in a supersedure situation, and then we're getting them to feel like they're in a swarm situation. An emergency response, and then we're moving them into swarm mode. So they immediately go, oh, we have lots of everything. We can make big fat queen cells. And we sometimes call that a cell builder, cell starter to start. And you can keep the same hive as a cell finisher, or you can actually switch. I will, I, yeah, I think we'll probably have to switch, at least going to the mating nukes earlier. To make this work in our apiary. So creating a queenless condition. So you could actually kill the hive, the queen, you could take her out of the hive. Somehow there's no queen in the hive. Or they don't perceive a queen in the hive. And I want to talk at the end about the ways that are actually work better for small scale people who only want a few queens every year. Sometimes the distance from where the queen is, from where she is held back by a queen excluder to where you've placed the queen cells is far enough that where you have placed the queen cells is queenless as far as the bees are concerned. That is used in the, what's called the Demeray method. You can block the pheromones for a few days, even just a couple of days. I'd have to look up exactly how long it is with a cloak board or with a double screen system. And again, it's partly distance, but it's also blocking the pheromones for a short while. And the bees aren't getting those contact pheromones. And how fast do they know they are queenless? Easily 24 hours, they know. So to get them to start building out queen cells, you convince them they're queenless. They don't have to stay queenless, but they have to perceive they are queenless. So you're going to trick them. And what you're hoping for is these nice big fat cells instead of awful, horrible supersedure cells. You trick them into thinking there's no queen there, but then you're going to give them everything they need. So you're starting with an emergency response. You got to finish with swarm conditions. Maybe the swarm conditions were always there, but you made them temporarily queenless. You can go back to queen right. There's a couple of systems where you do that. And we'll actually probably do those inside the, the apiary, partly to show it, to demonstrate it, and partly because it gives us a way to use our resources more efficiently. In both cases, you want a super good flow and a high young nurse bee population. And we're going to go for really good swarm cells instead of where we would have to kind of try to figure out how to get them off a plastic frame. See that you lose part of the queen cell if you try to take these off. So instead, we're controlling where those cells are going to be. While I was doing the research for this, I found this incredible video set that I couldn't believe how good it was, and I've not seen it recommended anywhere. Maybe somebody else here has already discovered it. Canyon Rim Honeybees. And I had to kind of, there was a dead end. I think they changed their website or something, and I kept dead ending, and I knew I'd seen this really great set. It's about seven videos total. And I, I can send these out. The first email I would like to send these links out because like I said, I dead ended and I knew I had seen it. 
uh, how to graph. Okay, the first one, let's see, Queen Bee Basics is like over an hour on queen physiology. If you want a quick review, great. Then the second one, part, well, part three, I skipped part one. Part one was just overview, really simple introduction. But this part two was, like I said, over an hour, covering all kinds of honey, of queen bee physiology and behavior and mating and everything. Then the next one, methods of raising queens, went through some of that historical, some of those wax foundation ones that are really hard for modern beekeepers working on plastic foundation to actually use. That one was uh, about 45 minutes or something. And the last one was very short for those of you who all you wanna do is just use that grafting tool and see if that part's even doable. And it is, I really think it is. This is the 15 minute, the last video. So I wanna send those links out to anybody who sends me their email. I'll put you on the email list. And you can also just tell me you only want a certain thing. And in that 15 minute one, they went through the different tools, the Chinese tool at the top. I actually could only make the rigid one work, but after watching his explanation, the Chinese tool, I'm gonna to give it another try. And there is a lot of queen physiology and mating behavior, but we're just gonna kind of stick to that mating window. We need the good weather, six to 20 days post-emergence, and those drones flying, no problem, we've got that. So weather is good, drones are good. Now, I, right at the beginning, I don't know how many people were prepared for me to say that to graft actually takes weeks to really do it and know you've got that proven queen at the end. Um, this, this slides off the journeyman manual. It talks about one to, to two day. Two days is getting pretty old for larvae if you can get the ones that have hatched you know and and, and there's good pictures and there's good pictures on that video i mentioned about you, you you don't want eggs but you don't want them completely curled around and that we'll go through that i'll send you out like some really good links on that partly you've got to have those ready you've got to set up the cell starter you got to make sure it's queenless, get them in there, and then eventually either continue that hive as a cell finisher, or if you're going to do another batch, you're going to need to renew probably the young nurse bee population. If not, they, the, you're, you're, if you're working by yourself as a club, we'll probably have to do two different systems there. Then you need to make sure those queens can mate and have a chance of getting back to where they emerged from when they went set out on that mating flight, get back to the correct uh, mating nuke, and then evaluate that brood pattern, which actually takes a while. So we've done a lot of prep work already. We've been feeding the hives. We did this the last two Saturdays. The people have already started with working on this and making sure that we are gonna have as much brood as possible. And we were, we were gonna definitely feed well. We were a little worried. We didn't see as much wet brood as we wanted to see. But apparently when the nectar flows on, some of the hives really got into, they wanted to go collect nectar. They went nectar crazy. Uh, I have a bunch of other things that we can talk about in, in emails and such, but how the nurse bees were fed actually affects how well they're gonna feed your queens. So when I say you start weeks in advance of the first of actually grafting, it's true. You can't just take a hive you neglected and it's been barely limping along and suddenly graft from it and try to pull nurse bees off it. You need to get your hives going. And that was part of what delayed us. I already posted this queen rearing timeline. It's actually an Excel spreadsheet that was done as, actually by the Susquehanna Queen Rearing Society way back on the East Coast. I'm happy to give them credit. And they, they said, go ahead and use it, you know. And I'll send you the Excel if you want to try this, like in your own apiary, your own club. Not everybody here is from this club, I know. And that's great. This is a click and drag, and it auto fills in days old, days of the week, date, from wherever you're starting. And then the duties. I changed the duties somewhat. I went for trying to do as much as possible on Saturday you will get pretty good results doing as much as possible on Saturday. 
So if you go through this, it takes you from the 15th of May up to the 1st of July, and you should definitely be able to see capped worker brood pattern. If you are really good, your eyes are good, you'll be able to at least a week earlier know that you've got worker eggs and larvae. But just in case, you want to make sure. So I figure we're going to have to go for eight Saturdays. Um, I have to skip the 10th. I have to be out of town, but somebody else might take that over. I'll be happy to send this out. It's the same thing as the Excel spreadsheet, just put on these lines so that people know what they're coming for that Saturday. Plus, we'll have a weekly email. If at this point your head is, bur is busting, this is about the point at which in a presentation, I feel like Edward Bear coming down the stairs now, boom, 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 on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs. But sometimes he feels there really is another way, if only he could stop bumping for a moment and think of it. And then he feels that perhaps there isn't. Okay, my first love was literature. It really was. And so to me, some of the children's literature, some of the greatest you'll ever find. This is where you sometimes are in beekeeping. So if you're hitting that point and you just need to come do the hands-on, Okay, sign up and do the hands-on. We're trying to set you up so that by July 1st, you're going to be able to leave if, you're, if you've helped with this. And I'm figuring if people have helped like three times, we'll, I know we'll have 21 mating nukes that we can make up that are four frame nukes, 21 holes, as they say. I looked at our equipment. That's what we can do. We'll have queen cells, extra queen cells, I'm sure, because grafting, you always end up with lots of queen cells. It's easy to get lots of queen cells with grafting. But if we can send everybody home who helps with a queen on a frame of her own brood and she will go home with no interruption in laying, if you can get her into a small hive is best, we'll recommend that, but you know, it's up to you. If you can keep the flow going, you may have to feed. July 1st should not be a dearth yet, I hope. And if you have younger bees in the hive, especially, recommended. I'm mentioning this because that July 1st sort of thing, okay, she's laying well, but if you want to requeen, you don't care, you can just pinch whatever queen you're taking out and put her, wait, you know, up to 24 hours, put her in. If you're selling her, I don't, I don't care. I'm not going to set any conditions on that. That's great. You know a friend, you'd like to help somebody, maybe you're mentoring. But if you want to overwinter her, I will warn you that the biggest problem we ran into last year was we had all these queens. And then to use overwintering, even the Michael Palmer method where you're doing it in, in five frame nukes or four frame. I did four frame nukes last year, double on two four frames on top of a divided 10 frame. Okay, worked pretty well. But I didn't allow for the fact that I'm going to need in a four frame, you're going to need four frames of bees and brood and four frames of stores per queen. Multiply that out and it, it would take all the resources. So plan for that if you're going to do this and if you're going to do grafting on your own. Great, but plan for it. And then they may need some extra protection because they're smaller. You might want to push them together. You might want to work out some system. Here's a publication that's available online. Um, six, uh, Pacific Northwest 682, done years ago. Michael Palmer does great videos on how he does his double nukes, how he wraps them, how he overwinters in nukes. I, and I thought it was very, it looked very inspirational. I tried it. It basically worked. Queen banking, you can't do very long. There are people who talk about doing it for months. I just can't believe that would be optimal. Already when you buy a banked queen, some of us have noticed that she doesn't always succeed, that she might be slow to get back into laying. She's been stressed. She hasn't been allowed to lay. Are her pheromones at the level they should be? Yeah. We'll go through some catching and marking. Um, Boy, marking all the queens last fall was really helped this spring. Um, I do want to get a queen, a queen muff. I think that's probably a good idea for people who are trying to catch a queen. Oh, incidentally, in case you haven't marked a lot of queens, 
the young ones are far more active and far more jittery and move faster than those sedate older ones you just need to touch up the paint on. So grafting is not the number one I would pick, but let's go through it, let's do it. Part of it is, do you really want this many queens? But the quality is gonna be good, you're raising them at a good time of the year. What do you want them for? How many do you want? Grafting doesn't, the, the equipment to just graft itself isn't the problem. It's all the other wooden wear. Mating nukes, nukes, how are you gonna overwinter them? And a certain amount of space, although you can save some with, with the nukes taking up less space. And you have taken bees out of honey production. In a short season, when we've had a late spring, if you're gonna be pulling resources off your honey production highs, you've given that up. Hey, but it's worth the experience. It's worth doing it. Um, maybe you would, maybe you would graft every other year and make the next one the big honey year. Okay, and here again, I'm warning you, if your head is hurting at this point, I'll try to finish up faster here. I'm getting close to the end. All the queen rearing methods. I always say, keep it simple. Oh, they're all going to tell you basically the same thing. They all have so many names, it gets confusing. There's all those methods out there. But basically, you got to convince the, the bees that they're in a queenless state. you got to get these bees just driven to build out queen cells around those fertile eggs. you got to have that strong nurse bee population with good nutrition themselves, providing good nutrition and brood care. Um, don't forget to move your cap cells. Don't let all the queens emerge at once and duke it out. And you end up with maybe one or two queens if you're lucky. Mark the calendar. And you need time on marking the calendar to evaluate the brood pattern. So is this the best method? I want to put in a plug here for if you have limited resources or space and you're running out of woodenware, trying to make a split for every queen, even a nuke. But then, because sometimes you're buying nukes especially for making queens. Hey, and that's a cost. Um, it's an investment. Okay, and you don't wanna do separate starters and finishes. finishers. You need to induce your queenless condition on a healthy, thriving hive using a cloak board, the Demaray system, which uses queen excluders, or the Snellgrove board, which uses a double screen. I'd love to go into this, but I'm sure people are gonna fall asleep and die on me if, if uh, it's death by PowerPoint, if I keep going. But those are three vertical methods. They save you space in addition to inducing that queenless state. And the concepts are, you're gonna separate the queen from those just hatched larvae, and sometimes you use these methods for uh, avoiding swarming too, for cutting down swarming and cutting down the perception of a crowded congested brood nest. So you're often separating the queen from the brood. You're getting this queenless state. You can start this a month or two earlier in this climate because you're putting the new hive where you, that what would be a nuke or would be a queenless small hive, you're, putting it on top of a hive that's providing the heat, the pheromones of a thriving hive when you let them rise up through and you completely block them with the float board and partially with the, a lot with the uh, snell grove too. And the nurse bees can move freely in the cloak board and in the demaray, but not in the snell grove board. So you are giving the queen cell producing queen builder cell and even queen finisher, you're giving it all the advantages of a large hive. So I just have some pictures here. This is a Snell Grove up here. Uh, and it actually sometimes is much more double screened, fully screened out. The cloak board has a sliding solid panel. The Demaray, you use one or two queen excluders. Don't wanna take the time to go into it, but I really love these methods. We actually have in our past monthly meetings, Michael Jaross came and talked about the Snell Grove. He did it in a more complicated way than I would, but it was an interesting idea. In parts of the world where they have a cool maritime climate, 
they are far more likely to use those three methods for their cell builder starter than they get it all ready. They can they use that more than we tend to in the rest of the continental weather type United States and the East Coast with their warm Gulf Stream coming up along their coast. Sometimes they eat my heart out for that, but that's okay. I love Western Washington green. Cloakboard, there's a lot on that. Sue Kobe, who is right on Whidbey Island, is really an expert. She really advocates for the cloakboard method, and she's written articles and done videos on it. You're going to use, you're going to have this, there's a queen excluder there, and there's actually a, a solid panel. You put this between the basically two hives, and by sliding that solid panel in for, I think it might be 48 hours, you have blocked all pheromones. But the queen excluder allows free passage of the bees, except when you actually have that solid sheet shoved in. When you do that, and there's actually some cheaper ways to do this if you, I actually can recommend some cheaper ways to come up with this kind of solid panel in between. But if you do that for that amount of time and you have your grafting cells or you just put the just hatched larvae up there and you want them to make to draw out those just hatched larvae as queen cells, you've got them in a queenless condition. Then you can take that solid board back out. The worker bees can go freely in between and you have you can do this much earlier in the year. The demo ray, you can find the system and the graph and the, this whole diagram in the beekeeper's handbook. If you get very far in beekeeping by your second or third year, you probably find you need to own the beekeeper's handbook. It's what else is there that's intermediate. After the beginner books, there's only so many other books. And this is one of them. And this just requires queen excluders, which a lot of people get with their beekeeping equipment. And I often say, I tell beginners the first year, please just put the queen excluder away. Okay, now you can take it out. All the beginner students that I told you that, this is a case where you can take it back out. Again, I would love to explain that. And here's another picture of the still grove board. And you can just decide you want to do the do little method. And the do little method has this, there are various ways to make it a little bit easier. One that will, I will try to do next week from today, place the drawn empty comb into the center of broodness of the queen that you like three or four days in advance of grafting. That's number three on here. And she will lay right there. And you won't have to pick out the ones that are the right age. You could just look, pull that comb, which of course you mark the top of, so that you didn't forget where, that, where you put that frame. You can pull that back out and you're gonna have the correct age larvae for grafting. You can also put her inside of a queen isolation frame or between two queen excluders. That's actually a method used even by commercial people. But again, there's these systems that you can hopefully get the queen to lay inside. Some people have great success with that. Whatever you're gonna do, it's gonna be the same thing. It just seems confusing because there's so many different ways to do the basic same, but keep it simple in your head. Um, and that's pretty much what I really felt like I had to say. So I think I could probably stop the recording there because I want to keep the recording short enough that people will listen to it, okay?